Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we have a lot to cover tonight as well as we want to allow a lot of plenty of time for Q&A as well. Last week we were here for almost two hours uh, processing everything, so I want to make sure to respect your time and respect our kids' ministry worker time as well. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. I do want to pray um, before we start uh, the, for the Lord to help us in our conversation today regarding spiritual gifts. <coughs> so if you please join with me in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for the opportunity of gathering together. We thank you, Lord, for the, um, the, your word and the work that comes from your word, the sanctifying work. God, today I pray that our conversation is an act of worship to you. That, Lord, we submit ourselves to the scriptures. We submit ourselves to your truth. And, God, as we are all on this journey of learning and discovering the mysteries of God and the, the true meaning of the text, that we would... Uh, uh, that the Holy Spirit would reveal that to us, that we wouldn't depend upon our own flesh, we wouldn't depend upon culture's uh, worldview, but instead, Lord Jesus, we would look at it through the lens of which you have intended. And so, God, help us to do that today, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so, uh, and just in order to wrap up our conversation from last week, I did have a couple of questions that came in uh, post-op. And um, I want to go ahead and address those because I think I can hit those uh, rather quickly. Before we get started, our topic last week was on homosexuality. And um, I had these two questions that came in uh, uh, after our uh, meeting. Uh, this individual said, I have a question I didn't get to ask. <coughs> How do you deal with peers in the school that practice homosexuality and or transgender? And so th to that person, I would say this. Uh, this is a great question of, of concern. And a great question to ask. Um, as we discussed, um, every human being has inherent value because of their, um, their image, their status as an image bearer of God. And so what we do is we treat them with respect. We treat them with love. Uh, we uh, sit by them at the, at the uh, lunch table if nobody else is. We talk to them on the playground if that's applicable. We sit by them in class, we concern ourselves with their lives, we build relationships with them, um, and we get to know them. And then we pray for them, and we pray that God might grant us an opportunity to speak truth and love and introduce them to God's Word. Here's what I would say. Um, if, you are, uh, if you find yourself in a place to engage in a biblical debate over this, just be aware that they are probably more informed than you are because they have already made, uh, formed their arguments uh, and, and formed their rebuttals. And so if you are to walk into a conversation, just know that uh, as you would, like if you walked into a conversation with uh, an atheist, uh, atheists tend to know more about the Bible than Christians do because they have uh, done their homework uh, to validate their position, whether it's erroneous or not. And so I would just encourage you to do your homework, uh, go back, watch last week's lecture, uh, at, continue to ask questions, uh, engage with the topic um, as God presents opportunity, um, and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. Remember, truth and love are inseparable. If you're all truth and no love, is, so you just come across as a jerk if you're all truth. Um, it's not that you're wrong, but you do end up becoming wrong because you're not expressing the love of Christ in your conversation. If you're all love and no truth, then you end up loving someone right into um, tragedy, into sin, by not being willing to confront uh, an issue in their life that uh, God deems to be um, sin. Uh, another question we had, a, a question tonight, if a, <coughs> if a guy was gay earlier in life but is no longer actively having sex with men, would he be able to serve in the church in a position of power? Um, so there's a, there's a number of nuances and questions that I would come back and address on this. The, uh, the, the thing that I would be concerned with in this situation is, was the repentance genu genuine? Uh, was it proven over time through uh, the fruits of their life? Um, for a person that used to engage in any sin, uh, which is all of us, Romans 3.23, for all sin and fallen short of the glory of God, whether it's homosexuality or it's a different um, sin issue, uh, there, if, if, if everyone was disqualified for church leadership because of past history of sin, you'd have no church leadership. Um, nobody would be able to lead the church. And so, yes, if an individual was previously lived a homosexual lifestyle, but they had turned to Christ and they had repented of their sin and fully laid that down, and they are no longer engaging in that lifestyle, they are no longer engaging in that, and also they adhere to the standards of Scripture which declare it to be wrong, 
then yes, there's opportunity there for an individual to walk into church leadership. Um, the previous sins do not disqualify church leadership as they have repented and turned from it, which is a great thing because otherwise I wouldn't be able to stand before you today. Um, and so uh, uh, my own previous sin, whatever that was in my life, uh, the, the long list of them, uh, I would disqualify me today. And so, yes, obviously if someone has repented and turned to Christ and trusted him for forgiveness and no longer walks in that sin, then yes, they, would, they, would, uh, be, they could be considered so long as called to the qualification of church leadership. All right, so I want to wrap up that conversation today. Not, not that nobody can continue to ask questions about it. I know that uh, it's something that's a complex topic. It's broad, and so we want to make sure that everybody that has an opportunity to ask questions does. Uh, today, our topic is going to be gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, as we dive into this, uh, I want to be re- respectful. I want to allow the Holy Spirit to sort of lead me today. Uh, I, I always come over prepared. I have 5,355 words down on paper for this, and I cut myself short. So as I go through this, I'm going to skip over some of my words just for the sake of time. But I want you to know if any of you want to request a manuscript of what I've written out, I'm happy to give that to you. And I will tell you at the end of, uh, at the end of our gathering today how to do that. Uh, I can re- so if there's any text or anything that I, skipped, I had to skip over due to time in our meeting today, um, you can have access to that. You can go and you can study it and process it uh, in your own time. Uh, with that. And so I want you to have that. But again, for the sake of time, 5,355 words. Last week was 5,100 words. Uh, and so we're, I'm going to make sure we'll probably, I'll probably skip over some parts or just make skip, scriptural references and things like that. So gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about that. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. A spiritual gift is any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit that is used in the ministry <coughs> of the church. In our conversation today, we will begin by ascertaining a general understanding of spiritual gifts, what they are, why they exist, and their general use, proper use in the church today. Uh, We are then going to drill down to some specific gifts, the charismata uh, in particular, uh, that's the Greek for the charismatic gifts, uh, and and some people call them the miraculous gifts. So here's some text for you, and and you all have a a, a document in front of you. In fact, I'm going to borrow one because I gave them all out. Thank you very much. I'll give it back, I promise. This has, uh, across the top, five scripture verses where we get lists of spiritual gifts in the scriptures, and it lists out the gifts that are listed in each of those instances, okay? And so I'm going to read some of those texts out to you just to give us a foundation of where we're going today, and then we'll jump in. Romans chapter 12, verse 6 through 8. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 through 10, for the one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And then verse 28, it says, and God appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then the gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. And then Ephesians (coughs) 4.11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. The first distinction that I want to make is the the difference in the role of the uh, spiritual gifts as it pertains to the relationship of the Old Testament and the New Testament, because it is different. The gifts of the Holy Spirit were in operation in the Old Testament, but in a much more limited capacity. Uh, We saw instances of resurrection, healing, prophecy, and other miscellaneous demonstrations of power. Joel prophesied, prophet Joel prophesied of a day when the gifts of the Holy Spirit would be more commonplace after the resurrection of Christ. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. 
So God pouring out his spirit on all flesh is a clear and distinct reference to the events of the day of Pentecost, which we read about in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit descends upon God's people and the gifts initially are manifested as a means of grace for the church and as a means of grace for the lost and being evangelized to the gospel. Now, Old Testament is Old Testament. It is, it's past. It's always, it's always interesting to study, but what is the purpose of the gifts of the New Testament? That's what we should primarily concern ourselves with in practical, everyday application in our lives today. Spiritual gifts are given to equip the church to carry out its ministry until Christ returns. A gift will always be used for what's called the edification of the church, which means the building up, the strengthening of the body for purposes of discipleship. 1 Corinthians 1.7 so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus. Acts chapter one, verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. So we see that, 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 that every believer in some aspect has spiritual gifts that they have been given what I think is very, what I think is very um, a, a healthy approach of uh, appearing this is that there are some gifts that are clear in the text to be permanent. There are some gifts by which um, an individual seems to have it throughout the duration of their life. There are others that are temporary, that come and go based on God's grace for a certain specific time period or need. It, it's really something to, to find a balance where, as Christians, we shouldn't be walking around discovering our superpowers, uh, that's, I think, what the, what the spiritual gifts uh, discernment turns into sometimes is people walking around trying to figure out, what's my superpowers? Do you fly? Do you shoot lasers out of your eyes? Um, do you heal people? Do you, um, can you read people's minds? And, and in our Marvel and DC universe, uh, universal world that we are so adapted to, it's like, well, you know, I'm more like, uh, you know, I'm more like Iron Man, you know, in my gifts. No, it's not, that's not quite the comparison. And it's not to our glory, and our gifts are not for ourselves. It's for the glory of God, and it's always for the edification and lifting up of other believers. So I think a more healthy approach is to, to acknowledge, it's, it's okay to, to acknowledge, well, I think the Lord may have gifted me in this, this, this way. Well, now I have a responsibility to, to, to hone that gift through the Scriptures, learn about it, and trust the Lord to operate through me in that. That is not the, to say that... Uh, there are certain gifts that uh, you would practice, like teaching, and there are other gifts you don't practice, like prophecy, um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. One of the most significant debates surrounding the purpose and the operation of spiritual gifts in the New Testament era is two separate doctrines. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out some $10 theological terms here. Hang with me. Don't get caught up in the big words. Just hang with me, okay? It is the doctrine of cessationism, versus the doctrine of continuationism. So before we establish and define what each of these doctrines hold, we must first establish a difference between the spiritual gifts. So all of you have a list there in front of you. I want you to take a look at that list. Of those lists that are listed in those, those five specific spots in Scripture, there are some of those gifts that are natural abilities. They're, they are normal human abilities that people that don't know Christ have but they have been supernaturally strengthened as a means for edification of the church. Uh, such examples would be helps, administration, wisdom, knowledge, serving, teaching, encouraging, contributing, leadership, mercy. People that don't know Jesus know how to do these well. But the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit come along and reinforce those and take natural abilities and add power to them for the purposes of uh, the ministry of Christ in the church. Then there are other gifts that are miraculous, supernatural. The, the only way they can be explained is if God was involved in them because they're beyond human ability. Such things would be prophecy, miracles, healing, tongues, which is speaking in a language that you don't know, faith, discernment, interpretation of tongues. And so what we want to do is we want, we want to look at the difference between these two doctrines because... We are a church, this is one reason practically why this is important. We are a church, if someone, you know, we're non-denominational, but if someone asks, uh, like, what are you? I, I tell people Baptocostal. We're half Baptist, half Pentecostal. 
And what I mean by that is, is that we're sort of reformed in our theology, but we're also continuationists. We believe in the ongoing works of the Holy Spirit. But because we're in that realm, we're going to have people that have Baptist background, more reformed backgrounds, and we're going to have people with Pentecostal backgrounds too that feel comfortable here. And, and so we have to make a distinction between these two doctrines because there's probably people in this room that fall on both of these ends of the spectrum. All right? So here's what this means. Cessationism, let's cover that first. Cessationism, or cease, is the view that the miraculous gifts or the ones listed as supernatural abilities, namely prophecy, miracles, healing, tongues, interpretation of tongues, has ceased. They don't exist anymore. They're not in operation. There are six reasonings. I'm going to fly through these quick. That The cessationists believe that the miraculous gifts are over. Number one, the Apostle Paul prophesied that the miraculous gifts would cease. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 through 10. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So cessationists hold to the belief that the perfect, what it's referencing here is the final canon of scripture, the Bible, the 66 books you have in your hand. That's the perfect written word of God. And once John wrote the final letters of the book of Revelation, we didn't need revelatory miraculous gifts anymore. They're done. It's closed. They're ceased. Okay? That's what they believe. Once the final canon was approved later on, the perfect was done, there was <coughs> no need for prophecy or that sort of thing. A second reasoning is the mention of miraculous signs in the epistles. So these are the letters in the New Testament that Paul wrote to the churches concerning their actions and doctrine. The letter, the only really the first letter to Corinth, 1 Corinthians, really addresses spiritual gifts. The later ones that were written chronologically after Corinthians don't talk about spiritual gifts. So the idea is, is that the spiritual gifts were already beginning to tone down and cease in operation in these other churches as they move closer and closer away or further and further away from the apostolic age at the end of the first century. Another reason is they believe the gifts of tongues was only available or for, it was a sign for unbelievers that God's salvation was now available to other nations. Fourth is that the tongues was, an, uh, speaking in tongues, was an inferior gift to prophecy, which it is. Paul makes that clear. And that prof prophecy would transition from new revelation to write scriptures to written revelation when the scriptures were finalized. So in a sense, there can be no more prophecy because all prophecy is scripture. So once scripture is written and finalized, we have no more need for prophetic uh, declarations. Number five, history does show up uh, or, or they believe that history shows a pattern that the miraculous gifts were not in operation or in heavy operation in the early church from the writings of post-apostolic church leaders and fathers, Justin Martyr, Christostom, Christostom, and Augustine. And the sixth reason is that the purpose of tongues is no longer needed, and they would advocate that the reason why they're no longer needed is if they were still in operation, the missionaries that were going to uh, foreign countries that spoke other languages, they would not need to go to language school. They would just be able to walk into those countries and speak their language, and so they don't, so therefore there is, there's no more tongues. So let's, let's shift gears and let's look at continuationists. Continuationists is the view, or continuationism, is the view that the miraculous gifts are the ones we list as supernatural abilities, namely and specifically prophecy, miracles, healing tongues, interpretation of tongues, is still in operation today. Here are the six rebuttals that continuationists would place against those who would hold to cessationism. Number one, the prophecy of the gifts ceasing and the reference to the perfect is not the Bible, but the perfect is Jesus. And that the gifts wouldn't cease at the canonization of Scripture, but the gifts would cease when Jesus returns in bodily form at his second return. The word for perfect in the Greek is teleos. It's referring to a state of perfection. It's not referring to an item of perfection, like the scripture, but a state of perfection. It means perfect, mature, complete, fully developed. It is clearly larger and broader, in, in my opinion, than the canon of scripture. <coughs> the second 
uh, a reasoning is the absence from direct reference to gifts in the later books. So books like Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, which are books that were written later in chronologically, does not necessarily, the, the, the reality is that they don't actually mention the operation of the gifts does not necessarily preclude that they weren't an operation. That, that would mean that every epistle would have to address every issue in the church over and over and over and over again to, to, to make that argument. And so to me, this is a, a, a null and void argument. It has been the case that the operation of the gifts didn't need clarifications for how they were to be used in the early church, and this was likely the case for the other books. Paul usually only addressed the things that that church needed to be addressed. If that church was healthy in the area of the operation of the, the spiritual gifts, then they don't need to be talked to about them. Corinth was not. Corinth was a, was a modern-day, gnar, hyper-charismatic mess. Everyone was walking around prophesying, speaking in tongues without interpretation, and it was out of control. And so Paul had to spend a length of time addressing how they were using all of these gifts unscripturally. And so these other churches, it, just because Paul doesn't bring it up, doesn't mean that they, it doesn't mean that they weren't doing it. It just means that they didn't have issues in this area. Uh, and, 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 further, and, and further tone of that, the, the latest book written was Revelation. It was written around 94, 95, 96 AD. The epistles mentioned by the cessationists were some 20 years earlier. And so the timeline just doesn't match up on that either. The third reason, while the gift of tongues was, was for non-believers, that didn't exempt the gift for other uses. 1 Corinthians 14.2, For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14.14-16, 14, 14 <coughs> For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to, to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? And so there is a notion in Scripture here that it's not just the application of a sign for an unbeliever, but there is some sort of benefit inside a believer's life for it as well. We see an example of this practically working itself out in Acts chapter 10 verse 45 and 46, it says, and the believers from among the circumcised who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Uh, and, and so here Cornelius received the Holy Spirit and began praising God in tongues even though there were no believers that are unbelievers, excuse me, unbelievers that were there present in the case. Now, we have to be careful not to make things that happen in Acts to be normative. We can't look at it and say, well, every time somebody receives the Holy Spirit by baptism, that tongues of fire fall on them. I don't think we've probably seen that since, uh, unless it was an, an isolated event, I don't think we've seen that since Acts chapter 2. So we can't look at everything in Acts and say, well, that's normative. That's the pattern and the prescription for how this is always done. There were certainly things that were done out of, uh, out of normal pattern, especially because there had to be confirmation to the Gentiles that salvation was available to them as well. But what it what would mean is that tongues can serve as a purpose outside of just assigned to unbelievers. Number four, while tongues was an inferior gift to prophecy, which is clear, Paul makes that distinction, it's an inferior gift, a healthy view of prophecy does not place it on the same level of Scripture. So most cessationists argue that if someone is prophesying, if they say, the Lord told me this, and they're speaking on behalf of God, so to speak, that they are saying that what they are saying should automatically be written down in Scripture because it carries the same authority. Since that's obviously wrong, and we've been we've been specifically told at the end of the book, you cannot add or take away anything from this book, lest your name be taken out of the Lamb's Book of Life. We know that that would be incredibly wrong to further add to Scripture. In fact, most heretical movements nowadays, this is where they come from taking external biblical references, adding divine authorization to them and following them by some self-proclaimed crazy person that calls himself a prophet. God has said what he was going to say and it's over. It's over. The book is finished. Most healthy continuationists would tell you that they don't regard any prophecy activity to be deemed worthy of scriptural authorization. In fact, most prophetic interventions use heavy scripture and only seeks to give direction and practical guidance 
to a believer or to a group of believers. Most of the time, when I've seen prophecy used as a, a, in a healthy way, it is used as a mechanism to call a believer to repentance for an ongoing sin issue that is not being dealt with or a general reminder of the time being short before the Lord's return or a clarification of his will for their life. There's some sort of practical application for a group of believers, for a church, or for a single believer in prophecy that draws that believer back to what is written. <coughs> now, I don't think that the argument uh, that everything that is, is prophesied needs to be written in Scripture holds up for many reasons. One is that we know Jesus said things in his earthly ministry that were not recorded. We have 30 years of unrecorded dialogue from Jesus. So if it is true that everything that God said needs to be recorded, then where's all of the, the dialogue that, of, of Jesus that was not recorded? So to simply say that God can't speak without it being Scripture would be nullified. In fact, he sits at the right hand of the Father right now ever interceding for us. So he's continually interceding for us. That would have to be recorded in Scripture too if we held to that, that, um, that idea. So Jesus... Uh, uh, so it does not mean that God cannot speak or use people to speak outside of Scripture itself. But of course, what he says will always perfectly line up with what is written. The fifth reason, continuationists would disagree with the cessationist position that the early church fathers didn't reference the use of spiritual gifts. I have some quotations because they did. They talked about it. Justin Martyr in AD 100 to 165 said early church, this early church histor historian excuse me, stated that the prophetical gifts remain with us even to the present time. Now it is possible to see amongst us women and men who possess gifts of the Spirit of God. Novation, AD 210 through 280, said, This is he, the Holy Spirit, who places prophets in the church, instructs teachers, directs tongues, gives power and healings, does wonderful works. Augustine, A.D. 354 through 430 is often cited as an early church father who rejected the idea of continuationism. That was early on in his ministry. However, later in life, he was so impacted by uh, the supernatural that he observed firsthand uh, in his life, and he ended up writing a book called The City of God. I am so pressed by the, pro the promise of finishing this work that I cannot record all the miracles that I know. The sixth argument for continuationism, the final one, is lastly... Though the original purpose of tongues is to confirm to the Gentiles that God's salvation did not exclude them, it doesn't mean that tongues only serve to fulfill that purpose. Now, here's what I, I must note. I have made six cases for cessationism, or what, for six cases of what cessationists make, and I've made six cases for continuationism. I'm not saying that's expansive or exhaustive. I'm saying these are the six most common ones. So if you have thought of other arguments, or you've heard other arguments, I'm sure they're out there. These are just six of the most common ones. Here's what we have to understand about this conversation. This is non-essential to the gospel. There will be people in heaven that come from both sides. I always make the argument, I think we're going to look at each other and we're going to laugh about how we are all wrong about it to some degree. This should not be an issue that divides us. There are certainly issues that should divide us. When we begin to con contort and distort the image of Christ or who he is, the personhood of G the deity of Christ, when we begin to mess with the cross and the resurrection, when we begin to call things that the Bible calls sin uh, okay, these are things that distort truth in the gospel. And these are things we have to draw harsh lines on. When it starts stepping outside of Orthodox Christianity, the, the authority of the Scriptures, the sufficiency of the Scriptures, the person of, of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, these are things you can't mess with and be within Orthodox Christianity. This, we can disagree on. It's a little gray. It's a little gray. And, and it's okay. There are brothers and sisters in Christ that, would, that are much smarter than I am, much more informed than I am, that would disagree with my position of continuationism. And I love them. And you know what? They make some solid arguments sometimes where I'm like, oh, that's kind of hard to debate. And so as I look at this, I stand where I stand, but I know I have brothers and sisters that stand in a different place on this. And I'm okay with that. And I think we can still edify each other and lift each other up. Now, that doesn't mean this is not important. Though it's not essential, it's still important and it's worthy of our conversation and our study and our attention. 
most of the time, <coughs> people that attend cessationist churches wouldn't feel comfortable in a continuationist church. Why? Well, if you don't believe the miraculous gifts are in operation, you're going to get a little freaked out if you hear someone speak in a tongue. Amen? So there is some differences here. Now, a continuationist might be able to survive in a cessationist church in the sense that, okay, I'm cool. I, I believe the gifts exist. I don't see them in operation here, but it doesn't mess with me as long as sound doctrine is being preached. That's possible. The other way around, it, it'd probably be tough. It'd probably be tough. It'd probably mess with your, your, uh, it'd probably mess with your upbringing, what you've been taught growing up, what you've experienced in church. Because if you believe the operation of the miraculous gifts, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to see them at times. And, and that, that would be hard for a cessationist who believes that they have ceased. So in their mind, every time they see a miraculous gift, they would think that it's out of the flesh or even potentially demonic. And uh, I will tell you this, that uh, there are, there's a pendulum swing here. You start getting, uh, there, there's an unhealthy view, just like with everything, the answer is somewhere in the middle. You start swinging all the way over to hardcore cessationism to where the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit don't exist at all. You're, you're, you're going you're gonna to start kicking yourself outside of Orthodox Christianity too. You swing all the way over to, to, to this, this neo-hyper-charismatic stuff where, where there's a free-for-all like there was in Corinth. Well, you're going to walk into that as well because what you're going to have is you're going to have demonic manifestations of, of, of these sort of things. The, the Satan loves to mock God. He loves to mock God. He loves to think, take the things that God has created to be beautiful and holy and pure, and he loves to mock them. He loves to make fun of the Spirit of God, make fun of the ways that God operates, and use his creation to do it. And so you're going to get really toxic stuff on both ends of the spectrum. So that's why we have to find balance. We have to hear our brothers and sisters out, go to the Scripture, and test it for ourselves. Regardless, every believer should explore the scriptures and pray for themselves to arrive at a place on this issue. It's definitely okay and necessary to be informed. Just because it's not essential doesn't mean that it's not important. So let's talk about the miraculous gifts or spend the rest of our time there. Our focus on the miraculous gifts is not inferring that the other gifts are not important, but rather these seem to attract the most controversy. So let's talk about prophecy. Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology book uh, regarding defining prophecy, this is what he says. Although several definitions have been given for the gift of prophecy, a fresh examination of the New Testament teaching on this gift will show that it should be defined not as pract predicting the future, nor as proclaiming a word from the Lord, nor as power for preaching, but rather as a telling someone that God has spontaneously, rather telling someone that God has spontaneously brought to mind. I don't know that I 100% agree with that, but, it, but, it, but he's making a very solid point. It, it is not to be overemphasized or underemphasized, I think is the point he's making. I would contend that most of the misunderstandings and issues that gifts of prophecy come from the nuances and the definitions of words and functions, as well as people's previous dealings and experiences with people who have done things and called them prophecy in a church. So if you've come out of a, a like strict cessationist environment, Baptist or something like that, you you hear a tongue, you're going to cringe on the inside. It's just not your experience. You come from a charismatic background like I did, um, uh, where it was unhealthy at times. Uh, tongue's not going to scare you, but uh, uh, you, you have a hypersensitivity to the abuse of it because you've seen the abuse of it. I have seen the abuse of it. I would also contend that the answer is almost always in the middle. There are extremes to both positions on this issue um, that we have to be careful on. Some clarifications we have to make. Is all prophecy from God? It better be. To insinuate or make clear that something you are saying comes directly from God, you better make sure that that is true. It is far better that if you believe that God is telling you something, it's far better to suggest that maybe the Lord's speaking to me, but I'm not quite sure. Far better to do that than to just outright say, God told me or God said without a clear defined confirmation that he did because this is a violation of the third commandment. If you say God told me and he didn't say anything and it was just because you had tacos the night before and you didn't get a good night's sleep and you just had a wild-haired crazy idea, then that's blasphemy. God told me this and he didn't speak. They killed people in the Old Testament for those things. Now clearly we don't kill people in the New Testament era for, for doing those sort of things. If so, we would all be dead. 
at some point or another, because we've probably all done this to some degree. <coughs> Let me give you an example of where this has happened genuinely in my life. I'm careful to use this example. I'm careful to use these types of examples because I want to make sure it's 100% confirmed. I was out mowing my yard, and this is when the, uh, the, I have some of my, mo- you know, you know you're, when you have, just, you have this place where you have moments with the Lord, like on a walk or on your back porch or when you go to this trip that you go on every year in the mountains. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe for some of you, it's like I got kids, so it's like that five second of silence when I'm in the bathroom. Five seconds, that's pretty quick. Um, 45 minutes. Uh, when I've got some peace and quiet, that's when I'm going to connect with the Lord. For me, it's mowing the yard. I got three hours. It's just me and his creation and the chiggers and the grass. All right? I got my headphones in, that sort of thing. So one day, I was mowing my yard, and um, I had a conversation with a gentleman, a good friend of mine, good leader, a year before that, almost exactly a year to today, actually. And we went had a three-hour lunch. Those happen to me every now and again, quite often, actually. Three-hour lunch, and we're discussing stuff, and we were talking about leadership stuff, and he was like, you know, sometimes in leadership, you have to, and this conversation just came out of nowhere, and he said, sometimes in leadership, you just have to burn the boats. And he said, there just comes these moments where the people want to keep going back to their old things. They want to keep going back to the familiar. They want to keep going back to the comfortable. And you, as a leader, you just have to burn the boats and say, you can't go back. We're not going back the new territory that we've examined. There's no way going back. He's sitting here and talking, and he, he explained a situation at his job where he did this. He actually took a machine that everybody in the, the plant loved using. They bought a new machine, and they had to get over this hump of learning the new machine. But long term, it would save the company a lot of money, and it actually would save them a lot of work. But they wanted to use the old machine because it was familiar. So he went in on, one, on Saturday and got some help and destroyed the old machine. Left it in a pile in front of the door when they arrived at work on Monday morning. Their old love of that old machine was left in a pile. And I was like, wow, dude, that is, that is awesome. He had people quit. He had people throw fit. But in six months, the company is doubling in profit. So I walked away from that conversation, and I kid you not, this is, this is part, of the, part of the way I know my body sometimes responds. I know it's kind of weird to say that, but you, you understand what I'm saying here a second. My body sometimes responds when I feel like the Lord is speaking to me. I walked away from that conversation to the car, and my knees were weak. Like, I felt like, I, I, I felt like you just had this conversation with the president or something. You know, it just like, uh, you felt like, or a, a, an important person, but like, you, you just kind of felt like, oh my gosh, I felt like that was for me. And, and at some point in time, I felt like that was setting me up because God was speaking through him saying, I'm going to ask you to do something at some point that will be, be burning the boats. So I'm mowing my yard and, and I, I clearly have an impression out of nowhere. I'm not even thinking about church. Pull the stage. I stop my mower, and I'm like, what? Pull the stage. And I immediately know what, it's, what I'm being asked, and I immediately remember the conversation that I had a year ago at City Butcher. I knew that God was asking me to rip our stage out, and now. So I, I text a few people that I trust in their discernment level. They have good relationship with the Lord, the prophetic abilities. I don't mean to sound weird when I say that. I'm just saying that they're, they're what I would consider genuinely gifted people. They responded immediately with big, bold letters, yes. So I was like, okay, I guess I got to do this. I went to leadership. I said, this is what I feel like God's asking us to do. Here's why. Here's how I'm going to process it. This is how I I immediately knew everything. I, I knew it all made sense to me. Like it was like this uh, deposit of divine understanding. Like it was just like things that I didn't previously saw, I just saw. I was like, oh, the stage is not inherently evil. I'm not saying that churches that have stage are doing, or need to repent and do something different. It was our problem, not their problem. That stage needed to go because we had developed a performance culture. We had developed a culture where people just came and watched all these people do their thing, clap, that was amazing, and go home. We had developed a culture like exists in a lot of the world's churches today 
where it was a show. You have vocational ministers that put on a job. We, put, we do this nice guitar lick, and we, we, uh, we, we set the atmosphere, piano pads, and, and we create this emotional environment, and we have emotional music that, it, that, that tantalizes our sensibilities, and really what we design is a service to appease ourselves. It was performance culture. Because I guarantee you, you remove the music that we were doing, there ain't a whole lot of spirituality going on in the room. I was convicted. We had developed a performance culture. It worked. I mean, we had explosive growth. So I went and pulled the stage out, had a couple people come in and help me. We pulled it out by hand and uh, left it in a heap behind the church. I took a picture of it because it reminded me of Mike's story of when he did it. And I, I took a picture of it and it was like, I felt like this piece, like there's no going back. We even took, there's a sign right here in the back that says, we are not going back. That was made from the wood of the stage. That was my promise that we were not going back to performance culture ever again. At that moment, from that moment forward, for the months and the years ahead, for those of you who are here with us since then, you have, do we not have a di diametric, duh. our church is completely different than what it was at that point. It's healthy, it's biblical, it's growing in the right ways. And we're not, we're not perfect, we're not there yet. But that, that was the catalyst that began doctrines of demons. That was, the pro, that was the catalyst that began our complete transformation that led us to where we're at today. We've changed our church governance. We've changed our affili denominational affiliation. We have, we have refined everything we've done. And it's been the Lord's help all the way, but it all began with a catalyst to say... We had to remove the object. The stage, is, it's an inanimate object. It's, it doesn't possess evil, but it had to go because it represented something in our culture that was unhealthy and was not glorifying to God. Now, of course, it came with opposition. I lost people over it. I, 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 I had to deal with oppositional, def, defiant sort of arguments. I had people leave that didn't even describe why they were leaving, but I heard through the grapevine they were leaving because of blah, blah, blah. But you know what? It's okay. Because they're in healthy churches now, and, and maybe they weren't supposed to be on this journey with us, and that's fine. I love them. But I look at it, and I think, man, one thing, right? So I look back, and I see the fruit of it. God does speak to us, guys. Just be careful that you don't go around all the time saying, God told me. That is the greatest way in the church that people are manipulated. You do not have any obligation to <laughs> roll out the red carpet for someone who says, God told me, unless the word that proceeds from their mouth is the written scriptures. Now, if when they say something, I'm feel, I'm, this is supposed to be a lecture, I'm preaching now. If when they say something, you feel it in your heart, it's right, and it's confirmed with the scripture, and you have an undeniable, well, confirm, okay, an, an undeniable confirmation, okay, Roll with that. Roll with that beautiful bean footage. But these people, I'm telling you, we've had them here. They don't fit in here anymore because we don't put up with it. You roll around here saying, God told me this, God told me that, and you use it as a way to manipulate people. It's not going to go over well because that's just manipulation. It's just abusing the name of our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for your own personal gain. So if you say, God told me, no offense, I'm going to test it. And you know what? I have a mandate to test it. And here's the deal. Most of us Christians, we feel like we can't test something when someone says, God told me, because we feel like we're testing God. No, you're not. God, Jesus told you, test the spirit. Or Paul told you, test the spirits. God is not offended when you test what a human being says. He's only offended when you test what he said in his word. Hypercharismatic movements, most notable one is NAR, love to make everything prophecy. They actively promote their students and disciples to practice prophesying to people in order to get things right, which is nothing short of divination and witchcraft. It's fortune telling. They will make such claims that declaring someone to be healed or delivered is a prophecy in itself and that those words spoken in faith have inherent power to make changes to spiritual conditions in people's health. This is nothing more than new age practices with Christian terminology that promote the pagan idea that we call the law of attraction. 
The law of attraction is a centuries-old demonic doctrine that teaches people that their words can create reality and change circumstances. And this is all clearly an attempt to be like God, which is the original temptation in the garden. Only God's words can create, change, or alter things. Fast forward here. 5,355 words. (laughs) Healing. Isaiah 53, four through five. Surely he has borne our griefs. This is a prophecy about Jesus and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. This is a prophecy of Jesus's work that points to the result of Christ's work on the cross, particularly for our conversation on healing. When it says that with his wounds we are healed, that word in the Hebrew is, it means both physical and spiritual healing. 1 Corinthians 15, 23, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. I think most Christians would agree the reality of a complete spiritual and physical healing is promised as a part of Christ's redeeming work on the cross. The question is, when? And this is where it gets a little icky. Those on the extreme charismatic side would argue that God always heals physically now. This is a ridiculous statement and position for many reasons. Pure logic is one of them. All of us will succumb to some ailment in this life that will end our physical life on earth. So clearly God doesn't always heal. Also, we see numerous occasions where true believers have long-term debilitating diseases and are never healed. Faith healers have come up with an excuse as to why this happens, and they usually blame the person that is praying for not having enough faith, which is another um, heretical concept in itself because faith is not something that we generate. It is a gift of God, and it comes from hearing the word of God. (laughs) <laughs> the purposes of healing is always to authenticate the gospel. It is always to point to the demonstration of God's mercy. It is always to bring and equip people for the service of the kingdom uh, in all of these things. But we know that sometimes God doesn't heal. James 1, 2 through 4, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Even when God chooses not to heal, there are benefits. And those benefits, even though they aren't physical, physical or eternal, which are much better, and they are to build endurance and character. Sometimes God doesn't heal people because there are certain, uh, we don't always understand. This is not a topic that we need to, I know it's hard for us, especially if we have a loved one or we ourselves are sick and we are not being healed as a result of prayer. I know that, I, and I understand it's a human thing, um, that we wonder why would God heal this person and not me? Why would God not heal me? That's those sort of things. Just know that God always has a greater purpose than sometimes what we can perceive. And this, this is normally not an issue we care that much about until we're sick. And, and then when we're sick, this becomes a demonstrably big issue. And um, oftentimes this is when people veer off into the hyper-healing charismatic theologies when they get sick because they, they begin to reach beyond the text and beyond the scripture and twist it and, and part of me, my heart hurts for them because I understand their own humanity in that. I understand they just want to be made well. Now, we can't place man or we can't place our own self above the truth in our pursuit of that. That's where, the, that's where we sin and go wrong. But I do feel for people who are struggling with this because they, they want to be made well. Now, the, just because God doesn't always heal doesn't mean we, we don't pray for people to be healed. But we, all, we always pray according to what? God's will. We allow him to decide what he wants to do, all the while believing that he can. The only question is, if does he want to? And we trust that if we pray for somebody or pray for ourselves and they're not healed, we trust that his prerogative, his divine will, is good. Well, how can it ever be good that someone would be sick and be sustained in that sickness? You don't know. Through that suffering, there may be an endurance. There may be a testimony. There may be conversations that happen. There may be, there have been people that have rolled up on stages that have been debilitating diseases and wheelchairs and, and preached some of the most amazing sermons I've ever heard from a place of true suffering and grief, and it's changed lives. You never know what God's purpose may be in the healing and suffering of this life. Here's what we have to keep in perspective. This life, eternity, 
And we know that our sufferings in this present age will give away to perfection. I know it's hard. We have narrow side of view right now. Lastly, I'll wrap up with this and then we'll get the Q&A. Speaking in tongues. Oh, probably in the most controversy of all of these. Speaking in tongues. Prayer and praise to God that is in a language unknown by the person that's issuing the prayer or praise. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 2, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God for no one understands him but he utters mysteries of the spirit. Here's what I'll say about tongues. Now, I'm, I'm a shortened version. Again, if you want the manuscript where it's more elaborate, you can ask for it. I'd be glad to send that to you in text form. Um, speaking in tongues is one of those things. We see it used in a very specific way in Acts. They are using an actual language. It's not babble. It's not this weird, unintelligible jargon. It's actual language that other people can hear. It's used as a testimony to the authentic work of the gospel. We see that Paul makes it clear if someone is speaking in tongues in a public environment, there must be interpretation. Otherwise, it's pointless because nobody can understand what they're saying. The responsibility of the interpretation goes back to the person who gave the tongue to begin with. Paul also makes it clear prophecy is preferred over tongues because it's usually in your native language. I think all of that is very clear. Is tongue still in operation today? It would be my, my belief that it is. Um, however, the times that I have seen it used properly, I can count on one hand in my entire life. The times I have seen it used improperly, Remember, I grew up in hyper-charismatic movement. Same lady, bless her heart, gave the same message every week. It actually sounded like the same tongue. Same older gentleman on the other side of the room gave the interpretation. It was the same thing every week. And it was after the same song, song number three, the musician almost died down at just the right time every service as if it was their thing that they did every week. Here it comes, sister so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. Brother so-and-so, thus saith the Lord, and it was the same thing every week. And it, what may have been authentic, true, and genuine one time, they loved the feeling that it gave them to kind of be the center of attention, and then it became a thing they did. And I, it, it put this icky feeling on the side of me because it was just a flesh. It was a demonstration. It was a show. Okay, They may have good intentions, but the problem is, is that they were abusing the gift. And it became just this thing that we expected all the time. Well, we're, we're an Assembly God church. We're Pentecostal. We have to do this. Tongues have to be in our service or God's not moving. You know, that sort of idea. And so, uh, and by the way, I'm not saying every Pentecostal church or Assembly of God church feels that way. I'm just saying that that was the mindset, I think, of ours. And so, um, so we have that. But we've been given clear parameters. Here's what I will say. There is an issue regarding tongues that I am still battling with. And I don't feel like I can speak from a place of authority on it because I am still wrestling with it in study. I'll be, I told you I'd be honest with you on all of these topics. And that is its use in private prayer language. There are some that advocate that tongues is something that can be used in a private prayer language to edify the believer, that there doesn't need to be interpretation because it's just between them and God. <clears throat> and there are some that would contend that this is not a scriptural use of the gift of speaking in tongues. I can't speak from authority on that. I'm still trying to discover the answer. I felt like I knew, but the more I dive into that topic, the more I find myself uh, at a um, crossroads with figuring out what that is. So I'm not going to speak to that from a place of authority. For your own benefit, I, 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 I suggest you study and push into that, and I will continue my own personal study as I'm at a crossroads with that particular topic in itself. All right, so I'm going to invite the elders to come forward. Sorry, that's a... Um, and we'll do some Q&A. Uh, if, if, Cody, if you'll throw up the number up on the screen, we will have the church text number, 417-815-5775. Um, so you can text your questions in to that number uh, if you so choose. Um, you can also, we're going to be running a microphone around. I do need some help with that. My normal mic guy is around. David Moon, will you help me? Mr. Moon? Okay, push the button. Green is on. 
That's off. All right. So if green is on, don't talk bad about. Yeah. 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 If it turns red, starts beeping through. Um, and so uh, we can ask questions on the mic or you can text them in. I'll be watching the text line. So if you see me on my phone, I'm not being uh, belligerent and annoying and, and disrespectful to you. I just want to make sure to catch those questions. But does anybody have questions about uh, spiritual gifts today? <clears throat> Okay. Um, how do you know what your spiritual gifts are? How, how do you locate that? The Enneagram? <laughs> I'm, just kidding. <laughs> I'm, kid- I'm kidding. No. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The Enneagram is new age. Don't do it. No. Throw that away. Sorry. That's one of those jokes that go too far. Yeah. DJ, that's a, it's, a, it's a valid question. You know, a lot of people struggle with that. Um, there's been some really good, not the Enneagram, but there's been some really good um, tests produced, um, one by the Southern Baptist Convention, um, a couple others, that are really good if you take it honestly. Um, as human beings, sometimes... We like to, we want to be something that we were never designed to be, if that makes sense. You know, so we have to take those tests honestly. And it's in, in my past history, I found a lot of people don't sincerely look at themselves and say, am I really good at teaching? Do I really care and have empathy towards those that are sick or hurt? You know, they think in their mind they want to. And that would be good, but is that really what you're geared for? Um, So while those tests are beneficial to kind of, if you take them honestly and you really self-evaluate yourself and, and, you know, use that first answer without overthinking it, they're good at identifying the avenues that you're gifted for, that you were created for. You know, like me, I'm, we talk about this all the time. Glenna is empathetic. She loves to cook for people you are and take not. care of people. I am not. I mean, that, that's just being honest. I'm not. I, 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 that's not my gifting. Um, you know, I, I just don't want any part of that where she does. You know, my gifting was more of an analytical teaching. I'm very analytical. So I'm good with teaching and looking at truth and studying it and figuring that out. You know, so what I'm trying to say, DJ, is that you just have to be careful with those tests, looking for a quick answer of what should I be focusing on when in reality what you should be doing is praying. You should be praying. Um, because here's the thing I found at almost 50 now. I've taken those tests many times over my lifespan, and my giftings have changed. I'm actually way better at things now that I used to couldn't stand. So during that sanctification process, God uses us for his will as he directs and desires. So throughout sanctification, that lifelong process of becoming closer to God and learning more about his word, I've changed inside of me. My desires have changed, the things that I find important. It's no longer as much for me now as about what Matt wants to do, but what does God want for me to do, okay? So it's, man, it's prayer. That's really what it boils down to. You've got to pray and read the scripture and ask God to show you, you know. And we've talked about this before. If you will be quiet and still and you will truly read your scripture and pray to the Father, he will reveal things to you if you will listen. You know, you have to be calm and still in order for that to be revealed to you so that you can see what what are you designed for, you know? And, and that's something I think all of us, you know, we hunger for as part of humanity of being a, cre- you know, a human is we create, we desire that thing that we're good at, you know? And I think if we will be still and calm and pray and study and read, God will show you what you're good at. 
If you would have asked me 30 years ago, DJ, if I would be if I was going to be a teacher of scripture, I would have said no. You know, and today I am. That's what I do. So. Yeah, at the uh, 1 Corinthians 12, after he lists all of the spiritual gifts, he says, all these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. And so I think that's the big thing, too, is, um, you know, the tests are interesting, but I do think, um, you know, prayer for God to use you let the spirit that the spirit uses you as he wills that will come out of you without you maybe even knowing what your spiritual gift is i think a lot of times someone else may identify it in you before you even identify that it's your actual spiritual gift if that makes sense so um, but yeah like matt said just prayer that you'll be used used by god and just to go along with what they said it's really tempting to want to try to figure out what our spiritual gifts are. Um, you can almost sometimes even become an idol. Don't be as focused as much on that. A spiritual gift, what is it? It's, it's to edify the body. It, it's to strengthen somebody's faith. It's to use faith, to, to reach out in faith, with the faith that God gives you and it strengthens you, and to help strengthen someone else's faith. So if you want to figure out what your spiritual gift is, wake up each morning and say, okay, how can I go out and serve the body? Because that's what the gifts are. How can I go out and, and bless somebody? How can I go out and serve someone? And if you just do that and just focus on that each morning, be in the word, ask God for those opportunities, he, he'll give them to you. And, and you'll start to figure it out. And it's going to be different ways for everybody. You know, I know people, I, I, have, I have people that I call um, if I just need some encouragement. I have people that I call if I'm struggling with something and, and need to um, get some advice or um, this or that. Some would say those are those people's gifts, and, and it's because I know I can call them. I know that they're solid in the word and that I can rely on them for that. Um, really, we just need to be in the word, like Matt was saying. We need to be in the word and prayer and, and just go out and actually be a servant of Christ. It actually takes action to figure it out. Be a servant, and, and you'll figure it out. It's good. Uh, ask somebody that knows you well, that's uh, attuned to the scriptures and familiar with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, but sometimes we're, we're, we have our own blinders on. Uh, I guarantee if, you, like Matt said, you take one of those tests and you take it based on what you think you have, everyone in this room is uh, a... a, a a prophetic beast with discernment to the sky. Like everyone, that's the, and we're, I'm guilty of this too. Like we all think that we're so discerning and that we can tell the difference between, you know, we can smell things from a mile away. But oftentimes, that, sometimes that's just human intuition, you know. Like women, uh, you guys have this innate desire to know when uh, men are not safe. You know, you just can, you can see it from across the room and you avoid that. Uh, guys, we have an innate desire to know the difference between good bacon and bad bacon, um, or a good grill or a bad grill. Uh, no, we, but there's some, there's some of that built into it's just as humanity, but discernment would be knowing what real spirit is behind what is going on. That's, that is something that takes a supernatural revelation. It's not just something that's human intuition. Uh, another question. So <clears throat> this, I was excited for tonight just because there's been a lot of experience with this in my life recently. But um, there's a couple things that we didn't touch on tonight. And it's probably because there's not a lot, a lot of biblical basis to it, but things that I've not me personally experienced, but I've seen genuine people's experience. Um, in that like slayings in the Holy Spirit or um, seeing beyond the veil, supernatural. I know there's not a lot of biblical stuff, um, angels and demonic realm, de um, deliverance ministry, things like that. I would venture to say that I've seen that more than I haven't seen it as far as people that believe in that. And the part that I've struggled with for the last year or so was trying to determine what, what are those things are, di are divine in nature. You know, what are they, um, you know, there's an awful lot of people out there claiming these supernatural healings. There's a lot of people out there claiming to be, to be slain or to have these prophecies or to have all these 
all these things. And I know a lot of it's heretical. I know probably a lot of it's false, maybe more so false than, than is true. But um, when it happens, as often as it happens, how are we as believers supposed to discern whether it's, whether it's divine in nature or whether it's, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I didn't always believe this, but, you know, some of this stuff can be satanic in nature, you know, can come from the kingdom of Satan, you know, whether it be healings or gifts or whatever it is that, you know, and that so it can be people that have actually been healed, but not by God, you know, and that's tough to, you know, and I don't know if my belief is, I'm getting that's my belief, not opinion of anybody else, but um, that's kind of what I've come to pick up the pieces along the way, and it's hard to, it's hard to discern that. I mean, how do you discern that and navigate that and walk that out in this life? That makes sense. I know yeah. it's a long-winded question. Yeah. So, one of the things... Is my mic on? There we go. We're not going to know on every, ma- on every situation. Like, we're not always going to be able to, to read every situational occurrence and, and know exactly. And it would probably be a waste of our time to try to do that with everything we come across. We would spin our wheels constantly. However, having a healthy, uh, having a healthy process by which we discern situations and when we get into these situations and we see things it is, is beneficial. So what I would say is um, birds of a feather flock together. So you you will typically see these, these uh, manifestations of the, of the Spirit. Uh, they all seem to run in the pact of the same group of people and the same movement, okay? Not, not secluded to just one, but you, they tend to run together. So the first thing I look at is who's friends with who? They're normally propagating the same ideas, if you have to tell somebody from a stage how to respond when God hits you, that's, prob- that's my first red flag. Especially if that thing that happens isn't clear in Scripture as a listed manifestation. Barking like a dog, falling over, uh, shaking, convulsing, laughing. These are things to me that represent lack of self-control, of which we see in the scripture in Galatians, one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. Now, they would say it's not a lack of self-control, that you're actually using your self-control to give it up to God so he can control you. No, that's a, that's, that's a play on words. A person I, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So the scriptures say that when the, the Holy Spirit operates, it's always going to look like this. So we have to look at the fruits, love, joy, peace, self-control. So if I see a person that is not in control of themselves, that's another big red flag. Something is in control of them. Is it their flesh? Is it uh, they've been worked up into a frenzy, hyper-emotionalism? Is it demonic? That's the part that I'm trying to tell you. We may not always know what's going on there. That comes to some people that have a gift of discernment, being able to see the actual spirit that's at work in that situation. Or as if God chooses to reveal that to you or someone else in any particular case. But that's, I look, is the person, do they look like they're under control? Now, there are instances in the Bible where people, they'll say people appear to be out of control, like the Mount of Transfiguration. <laughs> when Peter, James, and John fell on their face when Jesus pulled back part of his veiled flesh to display his glory. Uh, they were still under complete control. Those guys didn't go and fall backwards. Those guys, lay, they, those guys went down to their face and prostrate before the Lord. Like that was their only response. That would be similar to you or I coming up here and bowing our knee at the altar or laying on, I've done this before, lay on, lay on, like just lay out before God, just as sort of a thing of humility and repentance before him, being contrite before him. I'm still in absolute complete control of my body. I can get up any time that I want. So if the person's lost control, if they're, if they're doing things that are distracting, gyrating, barking, laughing, the laughing to me strikes me particularly offensive. 
Um, the laughing, uh, when I hear it, and it's been claimed to be a manifestation of the Spirit, it almost sounds like demons laughing at the Holy Spirit because it almost sounds like a cackle. And it, it just makes me like, not from, it just makes my insides honestly get angry because I feel like God is being mocked. And then we call it a manifestation of the Spirit. And it's a complete tragedy because there's nowhere in Scripture that says that. So to wrap up what I'm saying, go to Scripture first. Can I make a scriptural case for this being a a true manifestation of the Spirit? Then let's go to, is it a fruit of the Holy Spirit? Are they demonstrating self-control? Are they demonstrating love? Are they demonstrating peace? Are they demonstrating joy? Because God has said this will always be the result of the Spirit's work. And so if I don't see that at play, then I have a right to call what's happening into question. Then you have the aspect of God working in false environments. Can God save people and heal people in environments where stupid stuff is going on? Yeah, I was saved in a church that did those things, genuinely. Those are things we may not ever understand, how God does that. Now, that doesn't advocate that you continue doing it that way. God will hold to judgment those who don't go to repentance over matters concerning that. But God still saves people in the midst of those. He still heals people in the midst of those movements. And we'll, I don't know that it's our job to figure out who was behind it, if it was real and genuine in these case. Our job is... Uh, and for your job, for your family, is to say, I can't put myself in an environment where false teaching and manifestations that would be contrary to Scripture are happening. I can't put my family in that position, in that place. And if you, if you feel weird about it, there's a reason why you probably feel weird about it. So just explore that, investigate that. Josh said most of what I was going to say, but speaking specifically to slain in the spirit, there's another term I hear a lot is drunk in the spirit. I always think that's really interesting because you also have to look at what the Lord abhors to, what he can't stand. And one of the biggest things that he talks about is drunkenness. And you, and you just, you, if you put the two together and you really think about it, why would God mimic something that he abhors? It just doesn't really add up if you think about it. And it becomes, of course, from Acts and, and people thinking they were drunk because they didn't understand the language. But never did you see them flailing around like fish. Uh, the, the other thing, just to go back to what Josh was saying, um, none of this works if, you, if you're not inside the Word of God. And I really, I always harp on this, especially with the youth. If you're not in the Word every single day and in prayer, you're not going to be able to discern anything because it comes from this. You know, it's, it's so clearly, it's clearly laid out, and you can pray for wisdom, and God will give you wisdom. And what is wisdom? Wisdom comes from the Word of God. It's understanding what the Lord abhors and what he loves and what is the qualities of the Spirit and what isn't. And the more that you're in the Word, the more you'll be able to walk in situations and say, nope, not of God. Yes, that is of God. It's you just, you have to be in the word every single day. And if you're not, none of this is really going to work. So that's a great response. I love the drunk in the spirit example because the drunk in the spirit thing has is, is been so abused. Basically, it's like they're licensed to do whatever you want because there are a lot of things that drunk people can do when they're drunk. That's out of control. Like you're, you're literally out of control of your mind and yourself. And so that gives them license to do whatever they want. That's sort of their ga- gateway. Question. Oh, two at the same time. There was a race. Uh, you said that people, like, like, you can get healed, like, demonically too, right? So if somebody's been healed demonically like that, how do you explain to them, like, if you know that they've been healed demonically, how do you explain to them that it wasn't of God? Pass. <laughs> Honor? <laughs> no, I... Man, that's a tough question, man. Why couldn't you ask this at home tonight? Uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding, man. That's a great question. Um, 
I would, I would point to the practice by which they did it. There's, there's something I've been researching lately, not, not trying to go too in-depth, but Reiki or Reiki, an actual like new age healing technique that actually is employed by some faith healers that actually produce some level of uh, demonic healing in people. And so I, I guess for them, I would say, you know, I, I don't believe that your healing may have actually been from God because the methods that were used were more new age than biblical and, and call them to the scriptures to say, hey, it's great that you've experienced some level of healing, but if you're doing it in the wrong way, it doesn't make it right and that you need to only apply the scriptural methods, which is prayer, and um, to stay away from people who practice such things because it is a form of witchcraft. And most of the time when you have people that are healed demonically, because the, Satan is just a counterfeiter, he's not a, he's not, he doesn't create genuine mi- miracles, he's a counterfeiter, oftentimes what you'll see is those people will be sick again in a month. Um, people who practice the Eastern medicines and different things like that, which is sort of, it's just Hinduism pr- packaged in, in different uh, healing techniques. Oftentimes they'll be, they'll be sick, if not sicker, in a month. It's some sort of psychology that, that they can even block placebo. pain, placebo effect. And so I know I talked to an individual that attends a church in this area that um, they, um, they said they, they really felt like they were healed after they were prayed for. They could like jump up and down and all that stuff. And two weeks later, they injured themselves. They were more injured than they were before because of the hype of the moment. It actually blocked. They were so hyped that they didn't feel the pain, but then their jumping up and down ruined their tendon, and they were actually more injured. So there's a lot that goes into that. Obviously, I wouldn't just come out and say, a demon healed you. That's not probably the proper method, but but explaining how God heals and how the enemy interacts is probably healthy for them. They need to understand that. Exactly, and here's the big question. How did it point people to the cross? All right, so sometimes we have to take our self-centered humanity out of us and understand that we're not really as big as we think we are. You know, that... Hey, like we said, I'm, I'm talking to myself up here. This, it's hard to say to yourself, I'm not really as important as I think I am. There's a way bigger picture than Matt Lander. So how did it point people to the cross? Same thing as slain in the spirit, man. I've, I've, I've got so tired of hearing that in seminary. How did it point people to the cross? Are you seeking a demon out? Or was a demon cast out of somebody for the glory of God to bring people to him, to redeem them? It's the same thing, and you can see it. There's always that sign. When you look for how does it point, how does it redeem people, how does it bring people to Christ, it's not there. It's missing. And that's the first sign. When it's missing, when it's not for the glory of God, it's not pointing people to him, eh, I don't think it's from him. Yeah, it's a good perspective. Did you know there's a story in the Bible exactly addressing that? If you read in Acts 8 about Simon the magician, you'll see how Peter talks to him. So go home and look up Acts 8, okay? And Justin comes in with a mic drop. (laughs) All right, Honor, you had a question? We need it for this stream. Oh, my bad. Hello? Uh, are there just some people who don't have spiritual gifts? Who just, like, got done dirty? Uh, I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, I think Scripture's pretty clear, talking about the body of Christ uh, and everybody having a specific role, that everybody has some, a, a, spirit, a level of spiritual gift. Um, it, it's going to be different uh, for different people, but... Everybody in the body of Christ has a role to perform, and uh, we need giftings to be able to do that. And I think, in, uh, if I remember 1 Corinthians, it talks about different gifts, but it talks about that no, no one's gift is necessarily um, that the body needs all the gifts. And so essentially, when you become a Christian, you become a part of the body, and God will equip you with uh, the ability to help the body function. And, and we're all called to be in the Word and, and live that out to our fullest. And by being in the Word, we get to be a functioning part of the body, which is, is using your gifts that He's given you. 
That's good. Uh, another question? So I want to be sensitive to how I ask the question, so I don't want to prompt it in the wrong direction. So if you need clarification, prompt me for clarification. An attempt to raise the dead, is that an attempt at a spiritual gift and founded in Scripture, or is it something that's not scriptural? With raising the dead, raising the dead is not listed as a spiritual gift. So we all, we have the, uh, on the sheets there and all the lists, it's not listed as a gift. Raising the dead was not a normative process in the Bible. Throughout the entire Bible, I think there are seven times a resurrection occurred. Four of those seven, three or four of those seven was Jesus. And one was him, God raising him from the dead. Um, there is a call in Matthew chapter 10 that Jesus tells his disciples to go and heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. That scripture is often leveraged by the hyper-charismatic community as a authorization to the entire church to go and do such things when it is clear by context, that he is speaking directly to his apostles. And that there would be times, not often, but there would be two or three occasions where the apostles would raise someone from the dead by the power of God to the glory of his name. And there was always something that pointed to the gospel in each of those occurrences. I would say it's probably very unhealthy for a person to go looking for opportunities to raise the dead. Um, I couldn't imagine an embarrassing scenario where you tried to do that in a funeral and it didn't work. Uh, that would be embarrassing, tragic, and quite honestly, a mockery of the divine will of God to put them in that moment. It would be hard for me to categorically deny that it would never happen because God can do all things. There have been reports, and there are always these ancillary reports with no photo or video evidence that happens on the mission field. There are missionaries, I've received some of them, and they're always from a name I can't pronounce from an area of the world that I don't even recognize, that claim that they're raising people from the dead all the time. I don't think that's true. If that's true, get a phone, get something, and record the dang thing. Because I, I think that would make global news if that actually was occurring. What we should be most primarily concerned with, and I don't mean to Jesus juke the answer, but is the resurrection spiritually of the dead person to life. That is the matter that God is most concerned with, that our, that our lost friends and family come to know Christ and thus performs the greatest resurrection of all. I do think it is very unhealthy to go around and try to attempt to raise people from the dead. I think it is a, it's, a, it's a mockery of, of God. Any elaboration, gentlemen? You take me out of heaven, I'm going to be really mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just think, you just, it's true. You think about this, like Lazarus, like he had to, he had to come back and he's like, cool, I got to die again. <laughs> I'm going to have to go through this whole thing all over again. And that's the same thing as we said last time. When they raised the dead, <laughs> so it's the very same thing. When they raised the dead, when, when Christ did, when the apostles did, it was for the glory of God. It wasn't to just raise the dead. That's what a miraculous sign was. The miraculous sign was to show that Christ was God. So he raised the dead. He charged his apostles to raise the dead. All right, but if you go back, and you kind of talked on this in the, on the lesson tonight, if you go back into the history of the church and you read, and I'm not saying, you know, focus, because God has used his church over the last 2,000 years 
throughout the sanctification process. But if we go back to the early church fathers and we read the writings, they all unanimously say the same thing. It ceased. It doesn't happen. So if you go to 1 Corinthians 15, this is what, this is what a lot of them use. They like to use 1 Corinthians 15 starting in verse 12. And, and the title of that section is the resurrection of the dead. But when you read that, if you don't study it and discern it, it can kind of sound like, yeah, Paul's saying that we should raise the dead, but that's not what he's talking about. Because when you get to the end, he says, Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, Christ, if the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Baptized in his name. Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride, you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what he's saying is, if you read the whole thing, it's spiritual. It's not a physical resurrection, it's a spiritual resurrection. That's why we are baptized in the likeness of his death and raised in the newness of life. It's not a physical, it's a spiritual aspect, you know, and... and that's the one thing these guys use. They use Scripture to drive, try to drive their point home. But if you'll read the Scripture before and the Scripture after, you'll see the full context of what was going on and what they were talking about. And just to speak to healing in general, this is, this is something that bothers me. We, we, the Christian body has the habit, we love to look at healing and healing. Um, you know, and more the extreme charismatic movements love to look at healing and, and almost like, you know, God, we deserve to be healed. It's part of our right as Christians. And we love to look at scripture. So everyone loves to focus, you know, Paul with the snake, getting bit by the snake and healed. But no one wants to focus on the fact that at the end of Paul's life, he was taken to a tree and beheaded. And no one wants to look at the disciples, you know, the 11 disciples, that 11 of them were killed and the, the, the 12th was on an island and wished he was dead by the end of it. We, 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 love to, we love to glamorize Scripture and not see it for what it is. And the truth is, if you're a follower of Christ, you're going to be called to great suffering, and you're going to go through a lot of stuff. And that is the sacrifice to the gospel. We're not called to live in these, you know, and some, some people may, but for the most part, we're not called to live in these cushioned lives, you know, where, God forbid, I have to get contacts, heal my vision. That's not the way it works. We are called... Um, to, to, to persecution sometimes. And, and, and scripture even says, if you're truly walking out your walk with Christ, persecution is, is bound for you. It's gonna happen. You know, no one wants to look at Peter. They like to look at Peter's miracle. There's no one wants to look how Peter was hung on a cross upside down and murdered along with other missionaries, one of the most ruthless emperors of his time. No one wants to look at that. We have to put it into perspective. Those were the greatest, I mean, those are the apostles, were the greatest missionary who brought the, the word of God to the known world. And that was his fate. That's the fate of, of Christians. I hate to be depressing. We, I, read, I read out a list to the youth the other day where Paul lists out in the in scripture where he goes through all the different things he experienced. It was a little bit of a depressing sermon <laughs> at the end of it because he goes through all of this stuff. God uses people for his glory, and when he does heal, you'll see it's very, very specific to continue on the work of his kingdom and bring glory to him. It's very specific. And most of the time, the guys that are experiencing that went on to even more suffering. That's, that's what we're called to. We, we sometimes live in a bubble here, guys, and I love all of you. We live in a bubble here sometimes, and we're not seeing the big picture. But there is people in other countries and other Christians that are going through this type of stuff right now. We're just really blessed. And honestly, what scares me is it's probably one of our biggest downfalls here as Christians, too, that we don't have that reality in check. The payoff is huge. The payoff is huge. Amen. And here we are running around flocking to church services going... Heal my contacts, heal my contacts. And it's not, like, it's, not, it's not that you can't pray for that sort of thing, but, I mean, what a, what a mockery to uh, what other people go through. Yes, Rochelle. <clears throat> I 
I wanted to see if I could share a resource so people can actually understand what the church has gone through for thousands of years. Say that again, I'm sorry. A resource where they can read it themselves, all the suffering and the persecution that's been enduring. Uh, a resource that you could read? Yes. The Fox's Bo- Book of Martyrs. Absolutely. Yeah, The Fox's Book it. of Martyrs is incredible. It's a book everybody should own. Yeah, Yeah. it is. And it brings into perspective, like, and you see, like, and it was during the Roman period where they drug a person before the emperor, and they were like, well, we will give you the opportunity to denounce, or we are going to have you displayed before everyone and, and killed. And the person denounced, and a woman in the crowd cried out, pretty much that they denounced the Holy Spirit in that moment because they rejected God. And they brought her out of the stands and had her killed. And they gave her the opportunity to, but she was, she was killed for it. But, and, like, it's not something I, I think about often, but every now and then I'm like, wow, like, it, it almost, we are so blessed and privileged in the lives we live where we make little minuscule things this big deal. And I don't know. Um, but I, there was also a scripture I wanted to share. When it came to the whole miraculous signs and stuff like that, and Jesus tell, tells his apostles in Mark 19, and it's talking about the abomination of desolation when it comes to the true Antichrist coming, and saying that, and then if anyone says, do you look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard, I have told you all things beforehand. I don't know. I, I'm, I tried to look that up as you guys were talking, because I like to have scripture as context for that. But if we look, want to look for areas of discernment with that, sometimes we're just not going to know. I don't know. I've seen a lot of crazy stuff, spiritual-wise, and it's just like, the only person who can save you in those moments is, is, is Christ, and that's who we live for, you know, so. That's good, and, and uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good sort of capstone on this conversation because what we're looking at here is really the core of where we go wrong with the spiritual gifts is when we lose track, and this theme has been throughout our conversation, when we lose track of their purpose, their purpose is always for the benefit of someone else, for the edification of the body, and for the glory of God. When that gets distorted, we begin to take things that God has deemed for a certain purpose and use them for selfishness. And we're a very selfish church in America. We, we, if things don't go our way, we're out. If, they, if, the, if the preacher doesn't tell me what I want to hear, I'm going to go to another church. Um, if if uh, the coffee wasn't hot enough, I'm done with this place. The music wasn't quite right. I'm gone. They didn't make me feel very good. I'm gone. And it's all very a self-centered type of focus. Like, it's about me. And, um, and really what we, what we gather is to edify each other, to build each other up, it's to, it's to um, grow in the word. And when the gifts are displayed, it'll never be for our own personal benefit. It may build someone else up, but when we turn it to be selfish, when we want to, when we're like a little kid going into a candy store, give me, give me a Tootsie Roll, God, you know, uh, let me be the guy that hands the Tootsie Rolls out. And we use it as, a, I think some people get in this trap of using spiritual gifts is almost like this power trip. Like, I'm the prophet of the house. Come talk to me. I, I hear from God. Um, I do this. You know, I'm the one that's gifted in this area. And it's almost like I hold the corner. So uh, as usual, humanity, we take things that God has deemed for his own purposes and we contort it and use it for our own benefit and gain. And uh, it's, it was never meant to do that. And so that's at the core of where all of it goes on, whether it's Weird manifestations, whether it's abuse of the gifts, whether it's false teaching, it all comes from our own inherent desire to want to spin things to a selfish direction. Um, I had a couple questions come in online. We'll hit those, and then because it sounds like we might need to do some deliverance next door. Um, I've heard some wall crashes. We might have to wrap it up. If you have any further questions, we've got our number up here. I'll hit these two, and then... Again, like I did earlier today, if there's any follow-up questions, I'll try to hit them up next week. 
<coughs> this came in uh, with the gift of prophecy. How do you know if you have it when you have two sides? Is this God or am I hearing from Satan? So you're not leading anyone to astray or lying or being deceitful. I know it will all be biblical, but even Satan used the word to tempt Jesus. And so here is, uh, with the gift of prophecy, um, I would say that um, I would be very, very cautious to claim that gift for yourself. Okay, now God may have given it to you, but be very cautious. Make sure that it's actually true and bona fide. If you are in a position where you are wondering if it's coming from God or Satan, um, I would take it to the scriptures first and evaluate that before you say anything that comes from, from your mouth. Go to the scriptures, evaluate it. Run it by an elder. Run it by a trusted spiritual confidant and say, I believe the Lord has told me this. Can you attest to it or can you confirm it? Use other people in the body to do that. Obviously, you don't, you want, you don't want to run to an immature, and by that I don't mean like an immature person, but a, a, tr- a, a believer who is new. You want to go to somebody who is spiritually seasoned, understand this sort of thing, and you want to go to the text in the scripture and pray over it. Um, God, here's the thing. We have to attest to God's sovereignty here. God is not going to put you in a position of confusion. He's not the author of confusion. So he's not going to drop something on you to where you're like, mm, 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 mm. he's going to make it clear. It may not be immediate, but he will give you the tools to arrive at a place of whether it is truly a prophetic thing that you need to tell someone or not. Uh, another question that's come in, we'll end with this one. Uh, Acts 8, 14 through 24, we see that the Holy Spirit was received through the laying on of hands. Is this a spiritual gifting for Christians today or something that only the apostles held? Great question. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the initial reception of the Holy Spirit, um, happens when a person comes to know Jesus Christ. This is a divine prerogative of God, meaning that it's completely in his sovereign will. He chooses to do it when he saves the person. Baptism of the Holy Spirit or the person receiving the Holy Spirit can be done outside of the laying on of hands, but sometimes God does commission the church to lay on hands at the point of which God chooses to give them the Holy Spirit. There could be some benefits to why this happens. First of all, when you see the laying on of hands, most of the time this action is commissioned to a particular leadership group in the church, the elders. There's a reason why. The elders don't lay hands hastily. We are commanded to not just start laying hands on everyone. Why? When elders, which are, your tr- which are the people that are in- leading the church spiritually, when they lay hands on someone in front of the body, they're signifying this person is one of us. This is a brother. This is a sister. We have, we have attested to spiritual discernment as well as a demonstration of the fruits of the Spirit that this person is a genuine Christian. Therefore, you can trust them as a genuine Christian. <clears throat> Why is this such an issue? If you two are to accept a person that is not a true believer into brother and sisterhood where you now treat them as a brother or sister, that becomes an issue because they have not submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ and they can become a wolf in sheep's clothing, leading people away to doctrinal errors and all sorts of uh, erroneous uh, things that lead people from Christ. So when elders lay hands on someone, when they uh, receive Christ as Lord, it is a declaration to the body, we confirm what we believe God is doing in the spirit by saving this person, giving them the spirit. Does that make sense? It's kind of like a signature. It's kind of like a, a per, it's kind of like church leadership saying, "Hey, one of us." And I don't mean that to sound like exclusive, like it leaves some people out, but not everybody that sits in a church meeting is saved. Not everybody, some people have a form of religion, but lack the, the deny the power thereof. And that's the power of transformation. Not everybody that sits in a church service is saved. There's people all the time that sit in church services that are not converted. 
They may sit and listen. They may enjoy the teachings of God, but they're going to walk out of here, and the, 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 there, there's no fruit of transformation. You can't let those people into your life like they are a Christian because they're not submitted to the same theo- they're not submitted to the same lordship that you are and it can cause destruction. That's why I always tell people don't date people and don't get yoked up with people and don't be like besties with people who are not saved because what happens I'm not saying you can't be friends with them. Please don't don't hear what I'm not saying. Is that at the very foundation of your life if if Christianity if you're a Christian Christianity is the foundation of your life. Pure. It's, it's, not, it's not a thing you do on Sunday. It's not an ancillary side piece. It is your life. And for you to yoke yourself up so uh, closely and intimately with somebody who has a different foundation, th- that, that is destructive and dangerous. That's, that's why God continually told the Israelites, hey, when you go in and take over AI, 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 them, you go to take over the Canaanites, the Amorites, don't marry their women. They're going to be new women that are good looking and you're going to want to marry them. He knew that. Don't marry them. Because these sweet little girls, these sweet little Amorites, oh, you're so cute. And then you get married and then all of a sudden she's like, can we put my Buddha statue above our dinner table? I just want to say one little prayer to it when we eat. Oh, that's okay, honey. Sounds good. That, that won't offend God. Oh, can I also, we have, a, we have this tradition in my family where I have a pagan God that sets over fertility and I just want to get pregnant. So can we, can we bring in the, uh, my little fish statue and can we just say a little thing to it and bow to it before we go to bed tonight? It just gonna, it's not a big deal. It's not going to offend your God. It just, it's going to help me get pregnant and that's to have, be fruitful and have children. And that's what happened. Every time they would intermarry, they, they would, uh, here come these, these sweet little cute wives and then the men would be like, oh, and then, and then they would get married and then they would begin worshiping each other's pagan gods. And God knew it was going to happen. That's why he said, stay away. And it's the same concept today. If you, if you yoke yourself up with a person, not just relationally, but friendship and all that, to where you're so integrated with their lives and your foundations aren't the same, you will end up worshiping their pagan gods because our flesh will always be drawn to that. So that, all that to say, the laying on of hands is a sign to the body of the eldership receiving them. It doesn't necessarily mean that someone has to have hands laid on them to receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? No, we're just laughing. Laughing? Did I say something stupid again? No. The fish statue. Oh, the fish statue. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, well. That's not the worst I've said, that's for sure. Hey, we're going to end the conversation there. As always, we've got a number. We'll go ahead and leave that up on the screen in case you decide you have a question that we didn't get uh, to get around to. Uh, so that's our conversation on spiritual gifts. Thank you for coming out. Next week, we will be talking about transgenderism. Uh, we will look at this cultural topic and what the Bible has to say about that. That'll be next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Y'all love you. Have a great week. Hope to see you on Sunday if you can.